Hey friends, just waiting for the system to go live. Thank you for being here live with us. We are live. Welcome back to another live session. What we're going to do today is talk a little bit more about putting fasting in context. The beauty of the internet is that we can, at any one of you, myself, uh, many other people, we can promote YouTube videos uh, and, and share research and talk about our personal experiences. And the problem with that, the beauty of that is we can make information more accessible. The downside of that, my friends, is that context doesn't always get conveyed in these short five to seven minute videos. So what I was hoping to do and share with you today is talk a little bit more about putting fasting in context and share with you why I'm not fasting as much anymore. And since cutting down on fasting, I've changed something else in my lifestyle, which has actually enabled me to stay lean, to continue to improve my blood sugar regulation parameters, but also I think, and many of you may or may not agree with this, improve various aspects of longevity, even though I'm not fasting as much. And so again, this is more putting context to the recommendation of fasting, because the downside of the internet is these, you know, broad brush stroke recommendations are not applicable to everyone. So this topic was actually brought um, brought about by a friend of mine, Anna, uh, Aaron Alexander, who we've had him on the podcast before. He has the Aligned podcast, Aligned Method podcast and bestselling book. We did a sauna session when he was in Seattle over the weekend. And when I was driving them to the airport, they brought up a lot of great fasting questions. And I thought it was really important to understand the recommendations about who fasting is for and who it isn't for. So that's what we're going to do today, friends. So uh, hopefully you can hear me okay. If you're here, if you can just hit that like button and just let me know in the chat that you can hear everything uh, okay and that we are good to go because we're just going to dive right into it. So as many of you know, fasting, whether it's prolonged, alternate day fasting, uh, intermittent fasting, and or time-restricted feeding are all protocols that have been utilized and promoted by many people on the internet to improve various aspects related to health, including uh, enhancing autophagy, which is this intracellular cleanup process that may help prevent protein aggregates that form in the brain, in the liver, uh, in the muscle tissue. It's been shown to decrease blood sugar and improve insulin sensitivity. It's been shown to decrease fat infiltration in the liver. Uh, it's been shown to potentially reduce aspects related to cancer by decreasing this pro-growth factor called mechanistic target of rapamycin or mTOR. So there's all these benefits linked with fasting. The downside of fasting is that you can increase protein catabolism. You can sort of prevent some of the benefits that you get from exercising. Uh, for cert for women who are already in a calorie deficit, uh, it can change you know their hormone uh, and menstruation, lead to uh, hypothalamic amenorrhea and loss of menstruation. Menstruation is a critical aspect of health, especially for obviously for young menstruating women, right? So there are downsides to this. Now, this is where I want to talk about putting fasting in context. And just right here, as we're about three minutes into this, who is fasting for and who shouldn't consider prolonged fasting or even intermittent fasting? So we're going to talk a little about the context here. And so just hold that thought. I do want to mention today's video is brought to you by our friends over at goodidea.us. This is an amazing carbonated drink that actually has branched chain amino acids along with chromium and also uh, different nutrients that can help support blood sugar health. So if you are wanting to improve your blood sugar control and regulation, let's say you're going to a 4th of July party, you're having you're at a social event and you don't want to drink drink alcohol, click the link below, my friends. You can save on this, goodidea.us. You can save on this. So this is a great way to just get in some branched chain amino acids. It's, it's a carbonated drink. And as we're cruising along here, I'm going to have one. Uh, the flavor that I really like right here, as you can see, is a black currant flavor. It tastes phenomenal. So let's get into who is fasting for and who is it not for. Ah, it tastes really good. Okay. So... If you, this is, you might want to take some notes. I mean, this is going to be just literally, I have no other content. I'm going to get to your questions in just a moment. So again, thank you for being here. Fasting is for people who are sedentary, who are insulin resistant, who don't exercise regularly. Fasting is a wonderful tool. If you're not physically active, if you don't go to the gym, if you do not hike, if you do not ride your bike, if you do not garden, if you don't do any exercise, you're traveling, you have a sedentary job, you have an injury that precludes you from going to the gym and doing exercise. Fasting is great for, for you. Why? Because you're not adding that other movement aspect into your, 
your lifestyle prescription program to improve blood sugar health. So you need to, fasting is wonderful for individuals like that. If you don't like exercise and you're just not going to exercise, you're stubborn, you're scared of the gym, you think meatheads go to the gym, you don't, you feel like you don't know what you're doing at the gym, of course, I would encourage you to overcome and surmount those perceived objections, right? However, if you don't like to exercise, fasting is for you. It's a wonderful tool. But if you regularly exercise, if you go to the gym, if you're trying to improve muscle mass like I am and not succumb to the sarcopenic obesity that happens naturally as you age, then fasting is probably not the best solution for you. And I'll share with you a modified fasting prescription if you exercise. But the problem here is, my friends, is we want to get the benefits from physical activity. And if you're doing exercise and fasting all the time, you know, it, you're kind of like going to be a C student in life. One of those things is not going uh, to be supported most beneficially. Meaning that if you're, if you're causing stimulus to your muscle, if you're exercising, if you're getting into a, a state of oxygen debt and you're pushing your body, fasting is not going to help you have a good workout. It's just not. I'm sorry. Now, I know some people say, well, if you do a fasted exercise session, you increase growth hormone and you cause all this stuff. Theoretically, you know, there's been a small limited number of human studies that have shown that. You want to have a good workout. Most people, now there are some, there are some anomalies out there, but most people have a better workout not fasted, okay? I know. Look, I know there's some folks. We've had Robert Sykes on the podcast before. We have Dr. David Jockers on the podcast before. Both of these individuals really benefit and they've made a, a, a habit out of exercise fasted. But for most people, they, they, they don't have the best exercise session. So I'm recommending for you, for longevity, for, for supporting lean muscle mass, for preventing age-related muscle loss, for improving blood sugar health, that you should prioritize your exercise sessions and worry about fasting later, You're just eating your last meal a little bit earlier, okay? And so this is one of the things that I've, I've switched up and I've had clients switch this up and they're actually getting better results. Now, look, it's hard when you've promoted something for so long. I've been talking about intermittent fasting on this platform since 2016 after interviewing all these people. So it's like kind of weird for me to say, well, I've kind of changed my tune, but I think we it would be just dogmatic of me to continue to promote the same old things without tinkering and trying and testing these things, especially with clients and people that I'm working with and finding added benefits to instead of doing these prolonged fasts and daily fasting for 12, 16, or, 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 or you know, 20 hours a day, one meal a day, although that can be beneficial, as I mentioned, for morbidly obese people, sedentary people, people who are just not exercising because they have a, a limitation, you know, an injury or they're traveling or they're whatever. Um, most people are benefiting from just doing time-restricted feeding eating earlier in the day, starting their fast earlier in the day, meaning cutting off that last meal uh, earlier. So they're giving themselves some time to digest and break down the foods that they're eating and focusing more on having good exercise sessions, uh, causing the stimulus to the muscle. Because the thing that we need to always recognize is that muscle mass, well, muscle mass in general, but specifically the fast twitch fibers tend to atrophy first as you age. Now, you, fasting doesn't improve the, the or prevent the loss of muscle fibers. In fact, prolonged fasting does accelerate muscle loss. Now, some people might say, well, I'm focusing on anti-cancer. Cancer runs in my family. You know, I've had cancer before. I have cancer tumor biomarkers, which was one of the reasons why I got interested in fasting, right? But we also know that there's so many health benefits, anti-cancer benefits, anti-inflammatory benefits linked with resistance training, having lean mass. The lean mass to fat mass ratio, especially as you age, is very important. There's this quotient that uh, scientists are talking about called the muscle quality index. Your muscle quality is linked to prevention of age-related diseases, mild cognitive impairment, dementia, Alzheimer's, heart disease, cancer. Okay, so if you have crappy muscle because maybe you're just eating one meal a day, but you're not exercising, so you're doing all the fasting stuff right, but you're not adding that stimulus to the muscle, your muscle quality is not going to be there, my friends. And as we just saw over the weekend, we saw the president of the United States, Joe Biden, fell on his bicycle. Right now, he's 80 years old. As a former cyclist, I would never put an 80-year-old 
on he had clips on his pedals like what are you doing giving an 80 year old they do not need clipped pedals okay that was stupid a staffer made a major mistake but if he had been maybe potentially regularly exercising and, and doing balance movers and stuff, uh, maybe that fall wouldn't have happened. Now, it probably happened because his foot was clipped in, but still, it just was a reminder to tell you and to remind all of you that we need to prioritize exercise, balance, movement, and muscle quality. If you want to go prove it yourself, go into google.com forward slash scholar. Check out muscle quality index. There, this is like an emerging trend where uh, scientists are able to actually quantify the health of the muscle. Now, when you don't exercise and you're insulin resistant, your muscle gets infiltrated by fat and that decreases the quality of the muscle and the strength and there's some limitations there. So um, not so good. So I, I want to get into uh, some of your questions here because they're, they're very pertinent. And there's a question here um, from Ada. Ada says, define a prolonged fast. Okay. In my opinion, now, of course, this is just, I don't know if it's anecdotal or subjective. In my opinion, anything longer than 18 to 20 hours is going to sort of fall into that category of a prolonged fast, okay? So most people, if you're, if you're physically active, if you're exercising, if you're moving your muscles, you know, I, I don't know that you need to do more than 16 hours a day. I, I wouldn't ne generally advise it because you're going to start to compromise some of the adaptations and the benefits that you could be getting from that exercise. You know, I, so many people, one of the most common questions, because as many of you know, we have an electrolyte product that has creatine, it has real salt, it has magnesium. A lot of people are using this around exercise. And so many people are saying, well, does this break my fast? You know, so many people are concerned about breaking they're fast with a little collagen or a little bit of, look, if you're exercising, this is the beauty about it. It doesn't matter because when you're exercising, you're accelerating all the same mechanisms that are increasing when you're fasting. That that's Exercise is the best fasting enhancer. So even if you're listening to me like, Mike, look, I know you stop fasting where you don't, you don't do prolonged fast as much and I'll share with you my, my protocol and things, especially during the summer, how things have changed. I'm not worried about these things breaking my fast because I'm walking three, four, five, sometimes 20 miles a day. It just depends on the day, right? Hiking, climbing, doing backpacking, biking everywhere. So I'm not worried about a little bit of monk fruit in electrolyte. Like that's the least of my concern. Now, I'm also, I'm more concerned about having ice cream before I go to bed. That would certainly compromise some of the benefits that I'm trying to achieve in terms of longevity, supporting blood sugar health, not gaining the visceral fat that tends to happen in individuals in their 40s, 50s, 60s, and beyond, okay? So we need to understand that a, a prolonged fast is going to be something more of 18 hours or more because what happens then is you deplete your muscle and liver glycogen, okay? You start to drop your blood glucose. Again, these are linked with all the benefits as well, but what starts to happen at least early on is there is a little bit of catabolism of skeletal muscle. Now, is it significant? Is it beneficial? You know, there are some adaptations that may, may be linked with this and so on. So we need to understand, and thank you for the super chat, Larry. I really appreciate that, Larry. Thank you for being here. Uh, Larry just gave us a super chat, which means he donated some money, which is great. But in that uh, icon of his chat, he has a, a dumbbell, which is great. So we're, I think... A lot of us have been convinced that fasting is a sign of one on. It's the thing that we all need to do. Well, yeah, it's helpful. It can certainly help accelerate some of the benefits that we're all trying to, trying to achieve. But I would wager that some sort of combination of resistance training paired with time-restricted feeding is going to be the best of both worlds. And, and, and focusing on, if you've been doubling down on your fasting and you've been doing prolonged fasts and three-day fasts and water fasts and dry fasts, and th there's all these things that people have been so excited about over the past several years. And it's great that people get excited about this. Look, I would never, never give up or take away or trade some of the the experiences that I've learned through prolonged three, four day, uh, five day fast was the most that I did. It's like four and a half days. I would never, I've learned so much about myself and, and I'm sure you have too. Um, it, it just, it's, it's a good mental exercise. It's probably good to clean, clean, clean up a little bit. I mean, there's no question that this autophagy process uh, is increased. There's, there's no doubt about that. However, I would just say it's a general feeling, general energy level, libido, 
my, my libido is way better now uh, than it ever was when I was doing extended fasting. We know part of that is, is hormonally linked, testosterone, growth hormone, DHEA. So, you know, generally just most people feel more vibrant when they're eating food. Now, am I, is this going to shorten my lifespan or your lifespan if you take my advice and start to increase resistance training and then focus on weightlifting and, and really getting progress in the gym and, and getting stronger as you age as opposed to getting weaker? Because I noticed that as excited as I was about all the intracellular mechanisms that are linked with autophagy and mTOR inhibition and all of this, you know, that came at a, at a cost. I was not getting stronger with age. Like, wow, I'm feeling older. When you start to feel older, it messes with your head. You start to think, well, maybe I, I am aging. Okay, maybe I, gosh, maybe, you know, I remember hearing my parents grow up saying, and I remember telling myself, I'm never going to say this to myself because thoughts become things, right? You manifest your life. When you start to say, I'm dumb, I'm fat, I'm stupid, I'm broke, I'm this, that's not good, right? You start to believe in that stuff. And so, you know, I heard my parents say, well, as you age, you just get, you, you get slower, you get weaker. And I remember as a kid, I was like, I am never going to internalize those thoughts. But guess what? When I was fasting all the time, I started to actually look in the mirror. I'm like, damn, I look older. I'm weaker. Maybe this is true. As you get closer to 40, this stuff happens. And so since backing off on the intensity and the frequency and the duration of the fasting, I'm not saying I, I still do time restricted feeding. We'll talk about that in a moment. And I recommend that for a lot of people, but not doing as much prolonged fast. I'm actually getting stronger, stronger or as strong now as I was 18 playing varsity football in high school. Okay. So to me, when I just sit down and, and pull my biases aside, it's okay. Would I take, you know, at 40, if I'm 22 years later, I'm just as strong as I was when I was at the, you know, sort of peak, you know, in high school, leaner, yeah, you know, more energy, more cognitively, you know, verbal fluency and, and more productive. To me, that's a better way to age as opposed to feeling weaker, more tired, and this, but just because I, you know, I can do a 36 hour fast with no problem. So, I've traded now, and I'm encouraging you just to reconsider this. And I'm again, if you're morbidly obese, if you have 150 excess pounds to lose, uh, if you're in a wheelchair because you, you can't go to the gym because you just had foot surgery, then then please consider you know focusing a little bit more on fasting for now. But for those of us who have been trying with the fasting thing and haven't been getting some of the benefits, I would I would implore you to reconsider and pr pr and focus and maybe try to prioritize a little bit more on your weightlifting and your resistance training. So um, before we have so many wonderful questions, um, another great one from Ada. What about how, how do ketones protect muscle catabolism? Ada or Ada, this is a, a wonderful, wonderful question. Uh, and, and let's get to it because I did mention that fasting can cause catabolism of muscle and it, and it can, and it does. To what extent? It probably actually depends on your degree of insulin sensitivity. The more insulin sensitive you are, the more physically fit you are, it stands to reason that less muscle mass will be catabolized because of exactly what Ada asked in the questions. And he said, I thought ketones prevent muscle catabolism. Yes. George Cahill has talked a lot about this. Unfortunately, he's no longer with us, but he has many papers on, on the internet and, and you know peer-reviewed papers. He's a PhD. Uh, and, and BHB, beta-hydroxybutyrate, the main ketone produced by your liver when you exercise, by the way, and when you fast, start to get into a prolonged fast, you know, that, that, that BHB starts to increase because glucose is low, insulin is low, and glucagon increases. That's the recipe to make ketones, BHB. BHB helps to prevent the catabolism of muscle mass. So there is this pivot, okay? And so that's one of the benefits there of being so-called fat adapted or insulin sensitive because if you're insulin resistant and you don't have the transport mechanisms to deliver those ketone bodies that are made by your liver into your muscles, into your heart, or excuse me, into your brain, then your body's going to try to make glucose because it needs some fuel. Your brain needs some fuel. And if, if there's no ketones around, then your body will try to make glucose. Well, how does it make glucose? By breaking down the amino acids in the muscle, Okay. So I'm just going to have another sip here of the good idea. Again, friends, click the link below. You can save on this. This is a carbonated branched chain amino acid drink. It tastes phenomenal. It has chromium and other nutrients to help support blood sugar health. So if you don't want to drink alcohol at social gatherings this summer, check out Good Idea. You can bring this. People will think, oh, you're drinking like a seltzer. You're like, yeah, 
you're really drinking BCAs like leucine, isoleucine, and valine, which is great. Okay. So we've talked about all the different, hopefully I've given you sort of a, a better context, a better way to think through this. And I'm trying to persuade you, um, and I don't benefit directly from this. I'm trying to persuade you to exercise more, to prioritize fitness and muscle mass and muscle quality, okay? And of course, you're probably going, okay, what are the workouts I need to do? How many days a week? We have other videos on that. But but for now, just think, okay, this summer, I'm going to focus on push-ups, squats, deadlifts, pull-ups, the compound movements, because I've heard enough. I get it. Muscle is important. Now, when you do that, you don't have to prioritize as much with regards to fasting. You can be a little bit more loose. You don't have to wonder, does the stevia in my coffee break a fast? Because you're like, who gives a crap? I just crushed it at the gym and burned 600 calories. I don't care about the little bit of stevia in my coffee, okay? That's the benefit of this. Now, there are still a lot of benefits to fasting, especially time-restricted feeding. This is, I think, something that humans naturally did. And if you observe animals, this is where, and I know I talk about chickens, but look, you know, I, the chickens aren't fasting. The deer are not fasting. Bears are not fasting. And if they do fast, it's in the winter. Okay. For most of you watching, because you live in North America, you live in Canada, you live in Europe. Now is the time when the berries are in season. We have sweet potatoes that are in season. We have all sorts of fruit that are about to come into season. It doesn't make sense to do all this fasting during the summer. I think, honestly, we should approach fasting as maybe more of a seasonal thing, maybe something that you do in the winter, in the spring, when food is unavailable, and you have shorter feeding windows. Like you eat during a five or six hour block during the day, and that's it. But in the summer, when the days are, are long, fruit is in season, we ought to be a little bit more mindful about matching. We talk about circadian rhythms and the 24-hour diurnal rhythms where we need light in the morning, we need darkness at night, but we should look a little bit more of a, a, a you know, look at this through a bigger lens and think about throughout the 12-month period. Think, you know what, during the summer, probably not ideal to be fasting when all this food is available. Again, context matters. If you're 400 pounds overweight, you have enough energy and you should probably consider fasting a little bit more in the summer. But for those of you that are already metabolically healthy and you're optimizing and tinkering and tweaking and just making small fine adjustments, I would implore you to maybe open up the window a little bit more, but but consider stop eat, stopping your feeding at least three hours before your desired bedtime, okay? As we've talked about, in other studies in women, we talked about this in the fall of, of 2021, where there were several studies that actually found that when individuals consume food or stop eating food six hours before their midpoint of sleep, which is essentially about two and a half, three hours before you go to bed, okay? Um, those individuals were able to prevent weight gain in contrast to the individuals who had food up till their bedtime. Now, there's been other studies here, but late night eating and snacking is not good for body composition, Okay, so we just need to understand, as I've talked about, yeah, fasting, you know, maybe we should prioritize weightlifting and resistance training more so than fasting, but we still want to implement some feeding window compression. And so again, just think about your, your routine and just make sure that you're trying to, on most days, I understand if you're going out with your friends, you're at a wedding, you're at a, a graduation party, 4th of July, look, stuff happens. You don't want to be a hermit. Social connections are very important. Uh, but try to not have a, a big bolus calories um, right before you go to bed, okay? So just, just focus on that. Time-restricted feeding, though, is still beneficial. And so I think, you know, what is, it, what is the medium or minimum effective dose of fasting? I would say 12 to 14 hours. So that's just what I personally still try to do, you know, try to have dinner around 7, 7.30. Some, and again, in the winter months, I wouldn't have dinner at 7, 7.30 because the sun has been down for two to three hours, at least where I live in Washington. But now it's not getting dark here in, in the Northwest until about 10 o'clock, right? So it's, you know, we're, we're, we're stretching out, we're opening the window a little bit more. And again, I see animals feeding in longer hours, the chickens. Not to bring up chickens, you're not a chicken, I realize, but we can learn from nature. Um, if you look at how the Wright brothers developed the first airplane, they observed animals, right? So we can, we can learn, 
you know, from animals. Uh, if you read the book um, about, you know, the Wright brothers, phenomenal book, but, you know, we can learn a lot from animals. And I know that's a different context. Flying is not the same as eating and fasting, but, you know, we can learn from, from observing behavior. Um, and I think we should just recognize the fact that as we get towards summer, we should be okay with a little bit bigger windows, a little bit more carbs and putting carbs in context. So that's presently what I, what I personally do again, haven't gained any weight. My body composition has actually changed right at 190 pounds, a lot stronger, more muscle mass, and the same amount of fat mass, actually a little bit less. So I will take that all day long. Uh, and I'm sure most doctors would as well. So friends, um, before we get to your live questions, I just want to say thank you for being here. Thank you for hitting this like button. If you're enjoying this content, share this with a friend. That goes a long way. Just send a direct message like, yo, check out this video. I think you might find this helpful. Uh, check out our show sponsor, Good Idea. And Let's get to your live questions. All right. Um, oh my gosh, we have a lot. It's so cool that um, you know that these topics. I was worried about promoting or talking about this stuff because I know that it's controversial and and things like that. Um, we have an, another super chat here uh, from Christopher. Christopher Ellis, thank you for this, and this is a great uh, um, question. Christopher says, at 73, after eight years of intermittent fasting, I am ready to build my muscles. Boom. This is the type of inspiration that I'm trying to achieve with this video. Now, Christopher, Ron, other people who have donated uh, or, or just that are here that are talking, again, I'm not saying intermittent fasting is garbage. I'm not saying you should never fast. I'm just saying sometimes, you know, when you have a hammer, everything is a nail. Okay, so we start to hear about fasting and, and everything. Fasting is the thing. That's it. You're not going to look at exercise. You're not going to look at Burbrain. You're not going to look at sauna. It's like you're a faster and you get into the fasting Facebook groups and you're watching fasting only videos. You hear about autophagy. You're like, oh my gosh, autophagy is so amazing. And you forget about the fundamentals, about muscle quality, about strength, about the importance of muscle mass, especially as you age, right? You see Joe Biden fall over on his bicycle. You're like, geez, that guy could have broken his hip, right? You're like, I don't want to be like that. I want to be strong. I want to be solid. I want to have a good foundation of muscle mass, okay? Good. This is what we're trying to, to do. And, and again, it's, if you're getting the benefits of fasting, fine. But please, just transition like 10% or 20% of that inertia away from fasting towards exercise. And I, I can... Really, I have a high degree of confidence that you will uh, benefit favorably. Okay, so let's get to uh, some questions. So Vicky says, I'm grateful for this perspective. I am active and have been feeling low energy and blah, blah, blah during my routine. Time for a change. Vicky, this is brilliant. I think this is a good comment that can translate over into many aspects of life. When something isn't working for you, it's time to switch it up. It's time to do something new. We get stuck in a rut as humans. Uh, and even as countries, as companies, they get stuck in habits. You can read the book by Charles Duhigg, The Power of Habit. This happens on the individual level. This happens with your groceries, right? And think about the last time you went to dinner. You're like, oh, it was at the same restaurant. 80% of the time, you go to the same 20% of the restaurants. 80% of the time, you do the same 20%. Of the, so switch it up. It's, it's good to switch things up. And I think that causes favorable adaptations within our metabolism, within our routine and things like that. So Vicky, thank you for wanting to switch it up. Bryce says, um, once you become metabolically flexible and you've achieved a good body composition, excessive and long fasting is not helpful. I've changed my mind on this and I totally agree with you. Okay, Bryce, thank you for uh, echoing some of the sentiments that we've talked about today. Ellen says, I don't think I'd ever eat enough to be able to fast properly. Um, this is the other thing. A lot of people are under eating anyway. It's just what they do. They have busy lives and jobs. And then you bake in a fast into that, and then they're really in a calorie deficit. Uh, and that's not, that's not, that's not whew, that scared me. Uh, and that's not good for hormones. That's not good for longevity. That's certainly not good for supporting muscle quality as you age. So, uh, Ellen, thank you for that. Great question here from Hamid. Hamid says So, autophagy isn't good for older people. More muscle is better. Hamid. I love this comment. Thank you for being here and thank you for asking that. And, and this is a great question. Check it out. If you were to ask any scientists, what is a better way to enhance autophagy? They will say that it's actually exercise, okay? Exercise increases autophagy. 
in a shorter period of time than does fasting. Okay, let's, if you were to, if I were to ask you, okay, you can benefit by getting this one physiologic process in, in a 60 minute session, or you have to do this other thing that's gonna take 36 hours. Which one would you pick? You'd say, I don't know what it is, but I would rather get this beneficial thing, i.e. autophagy. I'd rather increase that in 60 minutes as opposed to waiting 36 hours, right? Wouldn't you agree? 60 minutes or 36 hours? Most people would say 60 minutes. Well, guess what? That thing that I've been talking about, the beneficial thing is called autophagy. Exercise, just a 30 to 60 minute session of exercise increases autophagy significantly more than just fasting. Now, you've never heard about that because all of the people that talk about fasting will say you have to fast harder, longer. You need to be, right, with regards to enhancing autophagy. Well, there's various studies that have shown that just people that, that exercise actually don't have to fast as long to get some of the beneficial increases in autophagy. This is what's brilliant. The more metabolically flexible you are via exercise, the more benefits you get from your fast. I mean, this is, I think, really underrecognized. A lot of people think, well, to get more benefits from fasting, I need to go harder or longer. I did a five-day fast next time with water. Now I'm doing a five-day dry fast, and I'm doing 10 days. Pretty soon, it's like, where does it end? Whereas if you were just consistent with exercise and time-restricted feeding, and you sprinkled in a 36-hour fast once a month or once a quarter, you did a two-day fast, whatever, you're going to be way better off doing the latter as opposed to just doubling down and doing dry fast and, you know, all this, you know, stuff, right? And so that's what I'm saying here, uh, Hamid. And this is what's, uh, again, important to recognize that, that ways to enhance autophagy are not just, you know, it's not just one modality. There's multiple ways. And so we've talked about this. We have a course called the Autophagy Enhancer Masterclass. It actually goes into this if you're interested um, okay. Mike says, uh, Mike Abbott says, it also seems sugar, which doesn't have a natural origin in history, would be as good to concentrate on eliminating completely while ensuring that the nutrients that we need are coming from real food. Mike, this could be the nutrition book of the, a timeless perennial nutrition book, literally in that one sentence. That's all people need to recognize is yes processed food, especially refined foods that are often concentrated sugar and industrial seed oils and, and the like, um, are the problem, right? That is the problem. Uh, go to Europe and you find people have been, you know, they're still eating bread, but they're like making it, they're letting it rise over the course of several days. And then, you know, they're making wine and not using all these chemicals, but you're like, well, how are they eating bread and drinking wine and having these foods, but they're not fat. They, they live, they're super centenarians in, in different parts of, you know, Greece and, and Italy and other parts of, of Europe. Well, uh, it's because you're eating foods that, that humans have eaten for long periods of time. They're not eating Pop-Tarts or Chips Ahoy or Oreo cookies. So it's important to understand. All right. Um, Ellen says, you don't look 40 at all. I hope you... Do I look like 45, 50? What, what do I look like? Um, hopefully I look younger. I'm, I don't know. I'm, I am starting to get some gray hair. I will tell you that. Um, but I appreciate uh, the, the comment. Okay, Kara says, uh, only do 12 to 15 hours of fasting. Look, I think that's just, that is totally reasonable. Um, but again, I work with a lot of clients who have been doing 18, 20 hours of fasting forever but they don't have the energy to exercise. And it's like, look, scale back the fasting a little bit and exercise more and you're gonna be a lot better off in the long run. Uh, Darth says, just like everything, balance is key. Yes, amazing. Okay, Carmen says, you people are going to make us crazy with all these changes every day. Today it's not fasting, yesterday it's fasting. Please, I'm so confused. You know, Carmen, I appreciate the comment and that's why I am always a little bit reluctant to do these videos about, hey, this is changing or that. Um, but honestly, I think if you're not changing things up, you're not growing, you're not learning. Uh, and and I, I think it's healthy to, to sort of change and adapt over time. And what I found when I got, like many people, very excited about fasting, doing all these prolonged fasts and water only fasts and sometimes dry fasts and this and that, yeah, it was great to see my glucose go down and ketones go up and oh my gosh, I, all this. Um, but then you look in the mirror, you're like, oh, I'm shrinking. I'm withering away, 
that's not good either. So that's why I'm I'm changing things up and just trying to share some things with you because I think it is it is good to change it up. And maybe this advice that I'm sharing with you of this hybrid approach of prioritizing exercise and also doing some time-restricted feeding or feeding with no compression, maybe that's not going to work for some of you. Maybe you need to still do the 18, 20 hours. And I think a realistic evaluation and consideration of your metabolic debt. You know, we talk about financial debt, but what about your metabolic debt? How long have you been in some resistant, overweight, and sedentary? That has something to do with this. Okay. Adi says, I'm new here, but very interested in this topic. What do you eat before you exercise and what time? So this is a great thing, and this is a wonderful tip. You might want to write this down. You would like, ideally, exercise at the same time every day. Your body is so good at adapting. It adapts to meals. And part of this post-meal or post-prandial hypoglycemia where, you know, some people, uh, you know, they eat and then they go hypoglycemic or some people when they first start fasting, they go hypoglycemic is because of the second meal effect meaning that your body is sort of guessing and trying to anticipate the ingestion of food from a circadian rhythm perspective. And if you miss a meal, your body kind of can have this cephalic phase of pre-meal insulin release. And if there's no food there, it can actually dip your blood sugar down. Okay, so this is important. Now, the same thing goes with exercise. If you start to habitually exercise, try to be consistent with the time to make a habit of it. So I usually train during my lunch break. And so this is uh, you know, around noon, right? 1230, something in that uh, that time frame to split up the day. And so I eat around 10, 1030, you know, around that ballpark. So my first meal, it's not like I'm getting up and just garbling oatmeal and eggs and uh, protein shakes. Like, no, I still do fast in the morning. I do my cold plunge, do my coffee with a little MCT powder, you know, not, not much has changed there. But I am having a little bit more white rice and some honey, you know, uh, in the morning, uh, along with protein, usually grass fed beef and eggs and some ghee butter. And then I trained about an hour after. Again, I've done all sorts of workouts, fasted, 24-hour fast, 12-hour fast, 36-hour fast. This is just me speaking. Other people are different. I generally have a way better workout when I do it after having some food. Um, and so that's, that's generally what I do. So that's a, that's a great point. Um, Brett has an awesome comment. Brett says, I think everyone here should get a commuter bike. 100%. Um, some of you, if you follow me over on Instagram, metabolic underscore Mike, will know that my daughter and I bike every day to school. We miss two days out of an entire school year biking to school. And that has been um, that has been really phenomenal for, for her circadian rhythm, uh, for her just getting a little movement before the day. It's been good for me. I'm a you know, circadian rhythm, sun, fresh air, movement in the legs. Um, so we went to a bike shop at the end of the season a couple summers ago and bought some used bikes for $300. Um, I, I would implore you to go on Facebook Marketplace and find a used bike. Bike to the grocery store, bike to your friend's house. You know, sometimes when we go out to dinner with friends that live in our neighborhood, we're not driving. We put food in the backpack, bottle of wine or whatever, and we bike over there and we have a blast. If it's raining, we just, we still bike back. You know, it's no big deal. Um, so I would encourage you to do that. Uh, Indra says, most top athletes don't fast much, but eat clean foods to keep uh, the lean muscle going. Yes. Great question here or great comment. Okay. Uh, Sarah says question will two to five quick bursts of resistance training over the course of the day be just as effective as a routine session done all at once. You know, Sarah, I, a lot of people talk about spreading the fatigue out. So I do think that's good. If you can do a few sessions, you know, throughout the day, I think that's awesome. If that's what your schedule allows and that, that allows you that little brief, hit of like mental clarity, clearing the mental cobwebs, you know, shaking up your routine. I think that's phenomenal. Um, Jenna says, I'm so, so smart and ahead of the curve. I've never fasted. I stay hungry for real though. Many uh, fast in the Bible for mental, not just physical. Boom. Jenna, you are ahead of the curve. Thank you for being here. Thank you for that comment. JNS Electronics says, according to Dr. Michael Eads, the Egyptians were called the bread eaters. MRIs performed on mummies showed they had diabetes from, and heart disease. Interesting. Great uh, comment there. Okay. Uh, Moen Ali says fasting works for you. Like I said, if, if things are working for you, please don't don't change it. Don't don't mess around uh, with that. Um, Ray in Michigan checking in. I usually fast for thirty six hours weekly, Saturday to Monday a.m. I think that's phenomenal. If that works for you, Ray. I mean, I was doing that for a very long time. I did notice though because I. 
do exercise quite intensely, I was losing progress. And so now I'm not, I'm not doing that. Um, I'll do a 36 hour fast, like, you know, once a month and things, but it's not a weekly thing for me anymore. Although for people that aren't as physically active, they're not biking every day. They're not hiking sometimes 20 miles a day or weightlifting 36 hours weekly, I think is fine. Uh, but again, we got to make sure that we're not losing progress with regards to increasing strength or at least maintaining our strength throughout lifespan. Okay. Steve King. Steve, what's happening? Thanks for being here. Chips Ahoy made me laugh. Uh, took me back to my childhood. Want anyone with good, a good old 2% milk? Do they still sell that stuff? Yeah, great question. So the Chips Ahoy uh, comment came because our my neighbor, uh, they have Domino's pizza delivered, popcorn and all this, and they my dog sometimes gets into their garbage and somehow a Chips Ahoy package was dragged over by the dog into my driveway. And I was like, what, what is this doing? I, I can't, this is bad PR to have a Chips Ahoy package in my driveway. So I grabbed it and I haven't thought about that for a long time, but it was pretty funny. Okay. All right, question here from Mary. I do whole body fasted, uh, I, I do whole body training once a week. Then I fast for 17 hours on my non-training days. I like it. Uh, my quarterly fast uh, range for five to seven days starting tomorrow. Um, should this video make me rethink my routine? Mary, look, continue with what you're doing, but have a honest sort of perspective or analysis of how this is working for you. So you're doing your 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 quarterly, again, a quarterly fast five, seven days. I think that's good. If you're doing that every month, see a lot of people are doing this monthly and just, just hammering down on this stuff. But since you're doing your whole body training twice a week, how do you feel you know, after you do the fast? Are you making progress? Are you getting stronger? Are you, you know, increasing strength and, and, and muscular endurance during those training sessions? Because if you're not, maybe scale it back. You know, Maybe scale it back on the five to seven days and just do maybe a three-day fast quarterly or a four-day. You know? um, so yeah. Okay, a question here. I think there's a, there's a uh, from Second Street Marvel. I was hit by a car last year uh, during my morning ride. Damn, that sucks. Fractured spine in multiple spots. Back on the bike and getting back to it. Ooh, that totally sucks. Second Street Marvel. Um, people now are just distracted. I got a story for you, but I'll finish up the comment here about what happened last night. Uh, interesting story, sad story. But um, people just don't text and drive. You know, for all the stuff about saving lives and we got to stay home, we got to wear the mask and everything. I see so many people texting and driving. I mean, 30,000 plus people die, die every year in the U.S. alone from automobile accidents. A lot of that is from drunk driving and from people being distracted by Instagramming or texting when they're driving. So just don't do it. Last night, I was driving home from a buddy's house and there was a deer on the road. And I have lights on my truck and I, I kind of flashed them and all the drivers stopped. And they saw it. There was this guy, he was in oncoming traffic. Uh, evidently, he he was not happy that the deer was taking its time crossing the road. So he just gunned it after being stopped and waiting and realized, hey, I'm just going to go anyway. Gunned it and hit the deer and broke its leg. And I could see the deer rolling on its hindquarter trying to get up and it couldn't. And I said this, you know, I was pissed. So I, I blocked him. I got out of the car and yelled explicatives, said, what the? Are you doing like what do you what could possibly be so important on a sunday father's day at nine o'clock at night that caused you to hit the gas and mortally injure a deer like you're a dick man what are you doing and he was like i i don't know that i think he was drunk or had been drinking or just an a-hole and wasn't used to someone confronting him like that but i was so pissed then it's like, what do we do here? So thankfully, a neighbor actually saw the whole thing, got his license plate, called some animal control. I was tempted to go back and get my bow and just finish the deer off because it was not moving. But the lady was, you know, gave it some water and stuff and called animal control and all that. I don't know what all happened. But um, yeah, people are just weird behind the wheel. Um, so be a good person. I mean, my gosh, if that guy has a Facebook profile that says, you know, wear your mask, it saves lives, and he's running over deer, it's like total hypocrite. Um, anyway, okay. Um, I really, really appreciate all of you being here. Thank you for being here. Are these lives helpful? If they are, let me know in the chat. Um, we'll be doing more of these for sure. And again, 
help our friends over at Good Idea. Check this out. This is a carbonated water with branched chain amino acids and chromium, vanadium to help you you know, increase muscle protein synthesis to have an alcohol-free yet carbonated beverage when you're hanging out with your friends, barbecue in the summer and things like that. Um, I'm very grateful that you all tuned in. And again, this isn't to say you should never fast. This isn't to say that fasting isn't helpful. Just translate some of that inertia towards weightlifting to building muscle, maintaining and preserving muscle, especially those fast switch muscle fibers. So um, yeah, we'll catch you all later. Have an awesome evening, awesome week. And uh, yeah, we'll see you later. Bye now.